All right, so um, this is kind of a little more informal. Um, if you have any questions, raise your hand or get my attention. I'll attempt to answer them if I uh, see you raising, or raising your hand. My name is Fred Wu. I work for the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago. It's a lot of words, so I'm going to refer to us either as the district or the MWRD. Makes life, everybody's life a little easier. Um, I'm a senior civil engineer. I've been there for about 15 years, specifically working in the sewer design group. So a um, little experienced. Um, who here knows what the MWRD or the district does? Raise your hand. Anybody? A couple people. Um, we're a regional agency. So let's see if I can get this to work. We are uh, guided by nine elected officials, our board of commissioners. Um, the MWRD was created in 1889. Um, its initial mission was to protect our drinking water supply. Um, this happened after the cholera outbreak in Chicago. I'm sure you guys have all heard of this cholera outbreak. This is why the MWRD was formed, to protect Chicago's drinking water supply. <clears throat> we have a service area of 883 square miles, which is basically about 95% of Cook County. Um, within those 883 square miles is 375 miles of combined sewer area. Who here knows what combined sewer area is? I think most of you do, so I'll just quickly go in. So combined sewer is you have a storm sewer and you have a sanitary sewer and they both go into the same exact sewer and they both get sent to the wastewater treatment plant to get treated. So Riverside is a municipality which has combined sewer areas. Um, we also own and operate seven wastewater treatment plants. Um, subject to, depends who you ask, we have the largest tertiary wastewater treatment plant in the world, which is the Stickney Wastewater Treatment Plant. If my memory serves me correct, uh, average daily flow there is between six and 800 million gallons per day, uh, with the peak capacity about 1.2 to 1.4 billion gallons per day. Between our seven wastewater treatment plants, we treat about 1.2 BGD, so a billion gallons per day. Anybody in the sector, most wastewater treatment plants talk about things in the MGD realm, and they're usually in the single or double digit MD, MGD realm, usually like 10, 5, 10, 15, 20. So our, our smallest wastewater treatment plant, which is Lamont, is about 20 MGD. So that's our smallest wastewater treatment plant. And there's talks that we're going to abandon that plant and just pump it directly all to Stickney because it's not really economical for us to continue to operate that because the scale we run things at, it's very economical just to pump it away to our largest wastewater treatment plant. Um, we service 168 communities, including the city of Chicago. Um, we own about 560 miles of intercepting sewers. So that's all those community sewers discharged into the intercepting sewer. So we're gonna talk more specifically about our Salt Creek intercepting sewer number two, which runs down First Avenue goes down forest and goes through the heart of Riverside here, but that's just a, shouldn't say a small portion, but a portion of our intercepting network. Um, who here has heard of the deep tunnel or TARP? I'm guessing most of you have. So we also control 109 miles of tunnels, um, ranging, I think they are about two to 300 feet below grade, so two to 300 feet below ground, ranging diameters from 10 to 30 feet in diameter. A part of TARP, which is the tunnel and reservoir plan, are the tunnels that I just spoke of, as long, along with two reservoirs. We have the Thornton Quarry, Thornton Reservoir, and the McCook Reservoir. The Thornton Reservoir went online last year, and the McCook Reservoir is going to be online in the next few years. So those will be additional detention storage for combined sewer areas to prevent flooding in these areas, including the city of Chicago or Riverside. So actually you have a tunnel system running underneath the river. River is behind me over there, correct? So there is a tunnel maybe 200 feet below ground over there. I think it's about 30 feet in diameter. So um, if you guys were living in the neighborhood, you might have, there was, they constructed it via blasting. So a lot of dynamite probably didn't feel too much of it because it was so far underground in the bedrock. But it's just interesting injuring knowledge to know that we have these things going on in the area. The construction of that started in 1972, before I was born. So design started in the 60s, again, before I was born. So this is predates me by a fair amount. Um, we also are responsible for the stormwater management of Cook County as well. We were granted that in 2003. And in 2013, we implemented a 
phase one of that, which is taking care of stormwater in the separate sewer areas. So that includes uh, construction of reservoirs, maintenance of reservoirs, stream bank um, maintenance, all sorts of great things. Make sure stormwater is not ponding in people's basements or front yards, going where it should go. And then we have phase two now, which is, I believe part of Riverside is part of phase two, which is some of, part of phase two is the acquisition of properties as well. So there's a portion, it's getting the river. On the other side of the river over there, I think we have acquired 21 of the 39 properties. So, and then if we require all the properties, based on my understanding, uh, we have an agreement with the forest preserve that we will turn over that land to the forest preserve and they will, they're talking about improving it to a park, a dog park, a field. They're not really sure. Um, but the idea is that will remain open space. So if there is flooding, it'll go there first. So that's kind of like a localized detention area. So we're gonna talk about this Salt Creek job specifically. Um, Salt Creek, which, let's see if this is the pointer. Okay, Salt Creek starts here. That's the uh, VA hospital. This is all constructed under the same contract in 1928. So it consists of this entire black line here, not the dash line, just the solid line. Um, constructed in 1928, uh, serving parts of the village of Lyons, Riverside, North Riverside, Western Springs, LaGrange, LaGrange Park, Westchester, Brookfield, Broadview, Maywood, Bellwood, Berkeley, Hillside, and Melrose Park. So you may wonder why it services all these areas. Well, it's because you guys are pretty close to Sydney. So all these municipalities dump into our sewer system, which has to work its way to our Stickney waste, wastewater treatment plant. So um, the current project, it was estimated cost about $40 million. Uh, it consists of rehabilitating about 33,000 linear feet of sewer, ranging in 10 inch diameter to about seven foot by seven foot uh, horseshoe shaped pipe. Um, we plan on using, or the contractor plans on using cured in place pipelining process. We'll get into that a little more, a little later. Along with the geopolymer, um, it's a modified concrete, uh, along with rehabilitating 81 manholes, two junction chambers by spray on lining, Rebuilding and raising 11 manholes, mm -hmm. constructing a manhole, and uh, making some modifications to some uh, control structures. Just as a, a side note, when this job was awarded, it was probably one of the top three largest lining jobs in the world at that point in time. So the district is very serious about investing in infrastructure. So this is just a component of our infrastructure investment. We. I uh, just looked at the spreadsheet. I think we've spent over $100 million on rehabbing intercepting sewers. So our sewer system ages from, ranges in age from about 1902, and I think the most recent sewer we built was sanitary or combined sewer was about 2013. So this sewer is constructed in 1928. It's over 80 years old already, it's 90 years old. Or, 89 years old. So it's, it's a fairly old sewer. Okay, so we're, this is the initial construction of this sewer. It was constructed via two, me two means. It was constructed in tunneling mechanism and open cut. Um, so another poll. Does anybody know what tunneling is? If you do tunnel construction or open cut construction, I think open cut's kind of fairly obvious here. So here it's, it's kind of hard to see, but this is open cut. Literally, they just cut open the land and they construct a sewer in place. So usually it's occurring in shallower sewers or smaller sewers, okay? So here, this is at the intersection of First and Forest. And then this is when we have the confluence of two separate sewers. So let me go back a slide. Oh, wrong way. That is right here. So we have two sewers coming in and one sewer leaving. So they literally, hand excavated that in bedrock back in 1928. So that's our construction mechanism. So when they did tunneling to increase the hydraulic capacity of the sewer as well as increase the structural integrity of the sewer, they lined the sewer with concrete and sometimes reinforcing depending on the age that the sewer was constructed. 
just to increase the capacity of the sewer and the structural integrity. So this location, we actually pulled this out of our archives. This is actually in downtown Riverside at the intersection of Riverside Road and Quincy Street. So in front of this building, I don't know if this building still exists. Is it yeah. still there? Okay. I don't live in Riverside, so I'm not super positive. Um, our sewer, our seven by seven foot sewer is like right in front of this building. So it's kind of, kind of neat to realize that when we constructed it, this building was here. It was constructed by tunnel, by tunneling. Still here, still here now. So it's, it's kind of amazing, you know. 89 years ago, they did that construction, construction method and it seemed to work pretty well. I don't think there's been any road failures there in the 89 years. Now, how deep is it there? It's, it's probably about 30 or 40 feet deep. Yeah, 30, it's pretty deep. It's in bedrock too, so. So, okay. Um, so we, as part of the district's plan, we have a videotaping regiment that we implement. Um, sewers are typically taped depending on the condition on a three year basis, five year basis, seven year basis, or 10 year basis. So kind of we do an initial inspection. If it's in good condition, it'll enter into a 10 year rotation. And then if it's in not as good condition, those rotation durations will go down until it's like we need to enter, we need to entertain the idea of starting to rehabilitate the sewer so it'll enter into our um, kind of list of things to do. So, so here, this is actually Salt Creek intercepting sewer. So we can see, you guys probably, some of you are familiar with this. We can see lots of mineral deposits, infiltration. Infiltration, mineral deposits aren't the greatest things to be seeing in sewers. Um, actually, with, after the job was awarded and the bypass was put in place, right here, we actually found out that part of the bottom of the sewer was actually missing, which is very bad. Even though it is in bedrock, it's still not optimal. So that, you know, all these things led to the fact that this sewer did need to be fixed. And due to the complexity of the bypass plan, we felt it was a, the best way to fix it would just to be do it all at once. Because you guys are inconvenienced once. I'm sure you guys are very happy about it. But at least you're only inconvenienced once versus ha us having to phase it out and then being like, I thought you guys were done with this. And we come out like, you know, a year later and we're out again. And you're like, I thought we were. <laughs> OK, so prior to this job, um, being awarded, we actually, IDOT resurfaced First Avenue and Forest Avenue in 2014, I believe. So as a part of that um, process, IDOT approached us because where we saw that tunneling picture, there was actually no access point there, which is a really critical point because it's really two sewers entering, two very large diameter sewers entering a junction point and one large sewer exiting the junction point. So when IDOT approached us about this, they said, we're not gonna let you do any open cutting or any saw cutting into our road on First Avenue. So this is a chance to do it if you want to construct an access point. So we said, well, that's a really good idea. So we entered into an intergovernmental agreement with IDOT to construct this access point on the intersection of First and Forest. So here you can see, it's, you can see the odd shape. It's because two sewers are entering and one is leaving. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of hard to tell unless you're really close. Uh, the structure is actually 38 feet. It, they excavated down 38 feet to get to the top of the sewer. And I think about uh, 20 feet underground is when they started hitting bedrock. So that required a lot of like, I wouldn't say hand excavation, but it was like jackhammering bedrock to go construct a structure just for access. And it was really important that we put these things in now because it's really critical in our bypass plan. So really, and we'll get into this in the next slide. So bypass operations are, are critical because all these mechanisms require that the sewer be completely dry. So we referenced TARP earlier and TARP is running underneath the river over there. So not only does it provide combined sewer overflow relief for you guys, but it also does a really good job of providing bypass options for the contractor. So I'm sure you guys noticed maybe some bypass pumping like this, like some lines running around. But if TARP wasn't there, you would see larger pumps, more pumps, more pipes above ground just to bypass the flow. Because we had all those municipalities discharging into the sewer and you know we don't want to inconvenience the residents so we're not gonna put stop orders like do not use your sewer. You know, we want to make sure that you guys are able to do these things you know, 
like wash your clothes, use the bathroom, take a shower. So we require the contractor to make sure that all connections are active and able to be used all the time. So by constructing these things in advance, we were able to reduce the amount of traffic impact on First Avenue. How do you handle wet weather? Well, this, this is probably for a smaller line, like a 10 inch, 12 inch, 18 inch. So that's not a super big deal. So when we come to the larger diameter sewers, we will either, the contractor has to work around, they'll do weather, you know, obviously you look at the weather in advance. So they try not to do work when they foresee a storm coming. So that's why they were like doing a lot of work in the winter because it's generally pretty dry. So we won't, we generally will not let them bypass to our tarp system if there's a storm event coming. Because the idea of tarp is for, to capture storm events. So we don't want that filling up with non-storm event water. So that's kind of how we address that. So it's kind of, the contractor works with our M&O department to make sure everything aligns and everything runs smoothly. Um, Is the tarp water sent through the sticking plant? Yes, so all the water that enters into the tarp system after the storm event has passed and we are able to handle the flow, we will pump it up and treat it and then discharge it. So we actually have a tarp system that goes to Stickney. We have a tarp system at Calumet too, but we're talking specifically about the tarp system at Stickney. Is, is any of the tarp system separate so it only gets stormwater, or is it always combined? So the, the initial design of tarp was for a combine. So it addresses all the combined sewer areas. So when, when there's flooding issues outside of the combined sewer area, tarp does not impact that area at all. They're specifically designed to handle combined sewer area. All right, so kind of unique to this job. Um, is, has anybody seen cured in place pipelining process before? So, okay, so the two guys that work that are engineers, the engineers have seen this before. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, you basically take a, a felt bag and then you impregnate it with resin. And so this is not the super best example because this is a kind of a unique situation. This is a very large diameter sewer that they're lining, but the whole principle is hold on for everything else. So you take a felt bag and then based on the calculations, it'll determine what thickness bag you need and then you impregnate it with resin. And then so from that point, it's going into a shaft, like a shaft like this or a manhole, depending on the size of the bag. And it's either being pulled in place or inverted in place. So it's, if it's getting pulled inside out, it'll be, you, you, <coughs> excuse me, It'll be pulled or inverted into place. At that point in time, water or steam is used to cure the liner. The liner. So what's, what's occurring is you're raising the temperature of the liner and there's a catalyst in the resin mixture. And once about 180 degrees is mixed, the, the catalyst kicks off. And then the catalyst brings the temperature of the bag up to about 220 degrees. And at that point in time, the bag has basically become a solid pipe. So the benefits of this is you're getting a tight-fitting, jointless, corrosion-resistant pipe inside of an existing pipe. So corrosion's not an issue anymore. There's no infiltration coming in. So, you know, this is really addressing all these concerns. Um, so this example, like I'm saying, not, not the greatest example of what I was talking about, but you can see this is a, a fairly large diameter hole. It's about 11 feet in diameter. So they're, they're putting that in so they can put these liner bags in. So the liner bag is about two and a half inches thick. So as just a common rule of thumb, the MWRD manholes, especially of this age of sewer, have a diameter of about three feet. <laughs> so if you're trying to line a seven by seven foot sewer, that is not gonna fit in a three foot diameter manhole, no matter how you slice it up. Even if you take the framing cover off and take the cone off. So when you have a sewer of this size and diameter and a bag that thick, you are going to have to put an insertion shaft. So kind of do address the mechanisms we pick to uh, um, rehabilitate the sewers. These mechanisms are called trenchless technology. So they require less trenching or require less trenching than other technologies like open cut. So people tell you that, oh, it require no construction or no trenching, that is not true. You still have to do cuts, especially in sewers this size. It just requires less than versus if we have to cut open First Avenue, then cut open 
forest to like fix the whole thing. So it's slightly, it's slightly less inconvenient for you. On the topic of the lining, um, when you have those temperature levels, do you run the risk of having a flash flyer fire in the tunnel and you have to be careful about that? So when they're doing the lining, the first thing is no one's in the sewer is the first thing. So they, another thing is they have temperature probes located throughout the sewer. So whenever they're heating it up, they're able to measure the temperature uh, four times per second, about every two feet. So they're able to make sure that it's hitting that catalyst temperature, so they, and then they make sure they're not overcooking it too. Because when you start to overcook the bag, then you start to develop some problems with the liner. So these are things that mechanisms they have with the liner to address these issues. And does that also uh, assure the bonding of the liner to the existing pipe? It does not. So these, these liners are actually designed to be self-standing. Self so basically, the, the liner is using the existing pipe as like a, a form. So it's just pushing up. You have the pressure from the water, the steam, pushing the liner against the existing wall, and just using that as a form. And then it cures, and then it's hardened. Uh, I could have brought some samples. And I think that would be the. So there's no concern about the liner exerting force on an old sewer line? No, because I mean, the sewer obviously has some structural integrity anyways, because it's not collapsing currently. So we're just trying to um, address these issues before they really arise. We don't really want to. My department should not be coming out if there's a sinkhole. We're trying to address that before it occurs, right? So that's why we're acting, we're trying to act proactively. So that's why when we, like our group, we put out very large value jobs because we're trying to address all these issues. And we don't want to be coming back and being like, oh, now there's a sinkhole in the ground. What happened? What keeps the liner in its cylindrical form so it doesn't collapse on itself? So after it's cured or before it's cured? Oh, before it's cured. So the, so the water pressure from this, they're heating the water and then it's pushing out. So there's pressure. They're exerting pressure on the liner first to invert it if they're inverting it. So they have a, a standpipe, and I believe it's, it ranges, it depends on the installation, but I think the maximum pressure they're going to go for is like about 10 PSI, 10 to 15 PSI. So that's going to push the bag into place, and it's also going to fill up the, the void space in the bag, and it's going to push it out against the existing pipe. Anyone else? I've noticed that the contractor is using a lot of water off the herbicide fire hydrants. I hope he is paying for that, or is the district paying for it? I would defer to the village. I believe they have a meter, correct? Yes. Yeah, so then they, are, they built that into the bid price. Okay. So it is not free. It is not free. <laughs> OK. So. Another special, special thing about this installation is due to the size of this installation, um, the contractor has to do a wet out on site, which means they're delivering the bag, just the felt bag, and the resin to the site independently. So, and then they're impregnating the bag with the resin on site. So the reason they have to do this is due to loading limits in trucks. So resin is fairly heavy, and then you have a felt bag, and then when they're doing thousand foot plus liner installations, you quickly exceed the maximum allowable load on a truck. So when you see these large construction sites or large staging areas for this type of installation, it's because they're doing it on site because the size of the bag and the length of the bag that they're installing dictates that they do that. So, and actually the contractor does have a wet out facility in Bedford Park and it would, they would probably prefer to do it at Bedford Park, but they're just unable to do it and they're unable to truck it over here. So um, just as a side note, the major work at First Avenue should be completed by the end of July. And then after that, restoration of the pavement should be done. So I'm sure you guys all wanna know the schedule. Okay, so then this we're talking about, so the previous example, that's kind of a, a rare case, a very large diameter sewer, large bags. So when we're talking about small diameter sewer, this is an 18 inch diameter sewer that they're lining, half an inch thick bag. The contractor actually wet it out in their facility and they're able to truck it to the site. So when they truck it to the site, they use refrigeration trucks to uh, slow down the curing process. So, because when you start to heat it up, it starts to cure. 
So that's why they're required to do a refrigeration process. So you can see when I'm talking about that standpipe, you see how they had this pipe coming up pretty high? So they're filling this with water. It's actually not installed yet, but it's being fed into. So this installation is actually being done through an existing manhole. So like no excavation was required. They didn't have to cut the, I mean, this is not in a road. They didn't have to remove any dirt. They probably didn't need to take the frame and cover off. It's a half inch thick bag. So a lot of lining contractors, you'll hear about a lot of line contractors, they're doing 18 inch size diameter sewer. You know, that's kind of like, the, the, the sweet spot for lining contractors, there's a lot of them that do that kind of work. When you start getting to very large diameter sewers, the number of contractors that are able to perform that work decreases drastically to like a handful. So it's a very specialized work to start with, and then when you start getting into a, <clears throat> the outskirts of it, then it becomes even more specialized. Is the present contractor allowed to sub out the lesser work? So our uh, MBWBE requirements, I don't really know what it is for j this job. I'm guessing it's somewhere in like the five, five and five range. So I, I don't believe they are because, you know, it's really up to them to dictate how they're gonna execute the contract. But usually if they're able to do the small, the large ones are able to do the small ones and they'd rather sub out other things because they have control over this completely and they're experts in this. So, but they could if they wanted to. So this is what the liner looks like after it's installed. You can see the bag, it's holding shape. I think this has been in place for a couple months by this point in time. There's some wrinkling, usually it's caused due to uh, variations in the size of the sewer. These sewers were either tunneled or cast in place back in the 20s, so they don't have the quality control that they currently do. So sizes fluctuate a little bit here and there. We say seven foot by seven foot, but it could be six foot 10 by six foot eight, or it could be like seven foot four by six foot eight. So, you know, to the best of their ability. So here we're able to see the end of the sewer in the insertion shaft and the lining. So you can see how the liner goes to here. It's a nice tight fit against the existing sewer. So thus reducing the infiltration getting into the sewer. So if there's less infiltration, there's more capacity for things that are supposed to be going into the sewer. So we're not treating groundwater, we're treating things that need to be going in the sewer. Yes? How smooth is the surface on the inside of that liner? So is there any problem with it hanging up like algae and uh, stuff like that? Okay, so the, th that's another benefit of putting this type of liner system in is you are increasing the smoothness or making the smoothness of the sewer better. Um, so algae's not, first of all, algae's not gonna grow in the sewer because the way sewers are designed, there's a minimum flow velocity which prevents things from building up in the sewer because the idea is just to keep things suspended until it gets to the wastewater treatment plant. Once it gets to the wastewater treatment plant, we got all sorts of processes to take anything out of the sewer you want. So, um, and this will typically, even if you install a liner, and you're decreasing the diameter of the sewer because you're improving the hydraulic capacity of the sewer, you're, or because you're increasing the Manning's coefficient, you're actually in, increasing the hydraulic capacity of the sewer, which is actually like a double benefit. So not only are you restoring the structural integrity of it, you're increasing the hydraulic capacity of it. So you're able to convey more flow through that sewer even though it's smaller. How long does this lining uh, technology did affect? Okay, so the district, uh, first implemented this technology in, I want to say 1989 or 1992, somewhere in that range. So this, this technology actually came over from the UK through a company called in situ form. And I believe that was the first contract that we did was with that company as well. So now, any I mean, with any, any type of construction methods, you're going to have success stories and non-success stories, so yes, of course. But I mean, we've been doing it for over 25 years and we still spe specify that technology, so we've been pretty pleased with it. I'm, I don't know if the Village of Riverside has used it before. Okay, so, okay, oh, for water main. So um, the city of Chicago puts out, I think about $100 million worth of jobs for it every four years or something like that. So it's pretty widespread. Um, 
So the other technology we propose to use on this job, which is a little newer, it's called geopolymer. Um, this is about 7,400 feet of that 33,000 feet that I was talking about. It's of the seven foot by seven foot sewer located specifically in Riverside. So the job was not only Riverside, it was in Brookfield and then I think Maywood also. So this job was very wide reaching, but this technology geopolymer was specifically used in Riverside. Um, so geopolymer is a high strength corrosion resistant fiber reinforced geopolymer mortar applied to a structural thickness. And typically we also required a contractor to put some type of wire mesh in there or some type of uh, C grid or fiberglass grid system in there to increase the structural uh, stiffness of the liner system. So I'm going to get pretty technical here. So if I lose anybody, it's fine. The, uh, the structure of the geopolymer is a cross-link inorganic polymer network consisting of covalent bonds between aluminum silicon and oxygen molecules that form a aluminum silicate backbone with associated metal ions. So no. <laughs> so basically, I'll, I'll boil this down to be pretty easy. Geopolymer is very similar. It's not the same thing as concrete. It's very similar to concrete. The difference is you, geopolymers have a lot of um, silicon oxide or comparable components to it, which increase the corrosion resistance and increase the, um, how do I not want to word this properly? It basically changes the character of the concrete. It's no longer like a regular mix. If you're putting in a driveway, it's, it's not, geopolymer is not designed to be used for a driveway. You're gonna use regular bag mixed concrete. It's like calcium, or it's Portland cement, fly ash, aggregate, right, and water. But when you're putting in normal stuff. When you're talking about geopolymer, there's of course fly ash, um, Portland cement, aggregate. It's a little bit different on the aggregate. It's not the same grade sizes, and then you have a lot of admixtures included into that, right? So really what you're looking for is the amount of pozzolanic material, which is kind of probably above like everybody's head, including my head, but pozzolanic material is a combination of like silicon, magnesium, oxide, so it's basically a bunch of chemicals that you're looking for in the mixture, the bag mix design. So it's, it's a very specialized version of concrete. So a lot of people sell geopolymers, we're talking about something very specific for this application. So, and then on top of that, we have that reinforcing in there, which will increase the structural integrity of that liner. So it's basically you're pouring, you're not pouring concrete, but you're like pouring concrete back with uh, wire mesh, so with steel in there. So you're increasing the thickness of the, the concrete in the sewer with more reinforcing. So you're basically making it much stronger and you're, you're making the flow characteristics much better. So prior to the installation of this material, the contractor is required to stop all the infiltration. So we're talking about infiltration. So here, they've done a lot of injection grouting to control the water coming into the sewer. So this is kind of a finished product. You can see how it's in that gray tonish thing. So it looks like concrete again, but it's nice and smooth. And this actual sewer, you're looking into that Y structure that I was talking about way earlier in this presentation. So it's kind of like you can see how they have this bulkhead here. So because they built that structure, they're able to construct this temporary bulkhead and keep water from entering into the sewer. So again, that, that structure was very crucial in making sure this job operates smoothly and quickly and well. So, so how do they apply it onto the existing So we'll get to that to the next slide. Is your question the same? In what situations would you use your bomber instead of the... Uh, so the... So, the, okay, so there's a couple of trenchless technologies. So we determined that the geopolymer was a little better application here because of the size of the sewer is the first thing. The other one was a six by six, I believe, and this is a seven by seven. So we'll talk about installation. So that's kind of a, one of the limiting factors on how this works. You're also required to basically not have it completely dry, but you're required to have man entry to do this application. So it's, that's kind of how are you able to do the bypass to make sure someone can go in there and do it. And there's a couple other factors involved with that. So, um, so outside of the, this is kind of the staging area for the geopolymer installation. I'm, I was driving around. It's over there. I saw it when I was driving around earlier today. Um, so basically what you have here is this tent here. 
um, or lots of bags of geopolymer mix. Dry mix um, needs to be uh, contained in a tent during winter because you basically want to control the the moisture and moisture content of there, and you want to make sure you want to control the temperature of it because. When temperature control starts to get out of control, then you start to have problems with the mix design, similar to concrete, right? So basically what they're gonna do is they're gonna apply dry bags of material into a hopper, loading into the hopper here, and then there's gonna be a, um, then there's gonna be a concrete mixer that combines the dry material with the water, and then there is a pump that sends it down to a spray head that applies the material. So there's actually, a couple ways to apply the material. There's a rotary spray mechanism. So they didn't use that in this particular applica application, but basically that's on a sled and there's a hose sticking out and it just spins out geopolymer to the outside walls. So this application is actually uh, required man entry. So on that sled, you basically set up the sled and you drag the sled back through the sewer. So it doesn't require man entry into the sewer necessarily. So this application required man entry. So they literally have uh, a gentleman, I, I believe they have two crews working at the same time. They have two, two crews working, applying the material with the nozzle. So basically they're spraying this material onto the wall. So, did that answer your question? Okay. So okay, we'll go over the uh, schedule for the rest of the job here. Uh, completion of the project is November of 2018. Uh, the goal is to have all the traffic established along First Avenue on October of 2017. Uh, work in front of the high school and Washington Avenue starts July 5th and should finish uh, by August 30th. And it looks like uh, current activities in downtown will be finished by the end of July and move to the intersection of Riverside Road and Lawton Road uh, and Riverside Road and Olmstead Road. And Questions? On the lining, whatever method you use, is there a potential that you could get an infrastructure um, failure because the water is infiltrating and then it gets trapped between the existing concrete line and the polymer or the lining and it bubbles and bursts? Okay, so the, um, there is that potential. That's why we make the contractor control the infiltration prior to doing any of these type of installations. Uh, certain cases, like if you're putting on a liner bag, if the infiltration's not really bad, they can actually do the installation with a little bit of infiltration coming in. Um, but that's kind of at the contractor means and methods because if something fails, we basically make them come back and fix it. So, you know, we have a lot of safeguards within the contract that require the contractor guarantee their work and ensure that it will not fail within, I think we have a, we require a five year maintenance bond. So we have a five year time period. If anything fails within five years, they're gonna be coming back and fixing it. And do you have on site third party inspectors working over their work? Yeah, so we have our own residential resident engineer on site overseeing their work. And along with that, we have testing protocols. So anything they apply, we have third party testing results to ensure that it's meeting what they submitted to us initially. So we have all sorts of QA, QC checks along the way. And we have people on site ensuring that it's constructed according to the bid documents. So what's the, what's the life expectancy of this rehab effort? The life expectancy of the rehab effort, um, we, we calculate it for about 50 years. So, I mean, obviously the sewer has been in place for 89 years. And then, you know, typical sewer construction, what's the lifespan of a sewer? 50 years, so it's theoretically 48 years past its life expectancy, but it seems to be doing a really good job. So, you know, we're just, the way we view it is we're just um, increasing the already quote unquote expired life expectancy. So, you know, in 50 years from now, I mean, it should be in pretty good shape because you still have the existing pipe behind it, which is still self-standing and still self-supporting. Does anyone calculate how much you're saving instead of a new installation for this method? Uh, we have not even attempted that because <laughs> the amount of, well, we would not even be able to do open cutting on First Avenue. I doubt would just laugh in our face. I'm 100% sure of that. 
And I'm sure the village of Riverside would not be very happy about that either. <laughs> so, and the residents wouldn't be happy about it. So that's why you know we're trying to address these. We, we, when we do these designs, we have all these things in mind in advance when we start looking at things. You know, how are we gonna impact the residents? How are we gonna impact traffic? So all these things are thought about before jobs even go out for bid. So. Flooding around um, when it heavy rains, uh, was there thought of making the uh, sewers larger? I mean, as it was dug out, I mean, can't they uh, add another f foot? So, okay, so, so I, I don't know, so I'm not the design engineer on this job, but I don't think that ever entered, we never even probably entertained that idea because that's the whole point of the tarp system is to accept those overflows when it, there's heavy rains. So um, I believe the McCook Reservoir should be online in the next two or three years, which is a huge storage facility of uh, combined sewer overflow, of combined sewer. So when there's heavy rains, it should alleviate that problem. I think she had a, someone had a question over here? Uh, that McCook Reservoir, the, what's the, the uh, capacity on the McCook Reservoir when they get it finished, do you know? Uh, uh, off the top of my head, I do not know. I know it's in the uh, billions of gallons. I've heard billions, not millions. Right. Billions so like, I, if I remember correctly, Thornton, which is smaller, and that's down in Thornton, right. I believe if everybody in the world put a gallon of water in there, that would still not fill Thornton Reservoir. Are they going to get the other side of the Thornton Quarry too eventually, or is that still just going to be the water, or what are you going to do with it? I, I, basically, if you're on I-80, you're in the middle of it. Yeah, so right. uh, um, I, I don't know if that's still an active quarry on the other side. So I, I'm not sure exactly how those agreements are working because we're working with a quarry directly. Um, that, that's another group that works at the MWRD. So, but I mean, the capacity of the Thornton quarry is humongous. Yeah. So, you know, I think if, you, if everybody in the world puts a gallon of water in it, it's like 70% full. So, I mean. And McCook is larger than Thornton, so you can kind of look at the, the scale of that. I'm familiar with the McCook a little bit because I do some volunteer work down in Hodgkins, all right, along the river, right. where they put the new sludge pits in and uh, all that stuff, and they've been digging rock out of there for how many years already? A long time. Yeah. So and, we're, that job is in coordination with the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. Yeah. So we're and I used it. to fish under their conveyor that took the rock over the river. <laughs> yeah. Uh, once the McCook uh, quarry comes online as a uh, as a point for the uh, for the overflow, do they go back and readjust the the amount that flows in from the neighborhood sewers uh, to 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 give more water into the McCook uh, reservoir once that's in online? So basically, how the system is set up, we have the, the, the tunnel system. So the, basically the, what the tunnel system does is the conveyance system to the quarry. So um, we have gates at every single connecting structure along the tunnel system. So based on how the tunnels and the quarry is filling, we adjust the gate levels. Are they adjustable remotely? You mean? Yeah, so it's controlled by the Stigney plant, oh, at the Stigney right. plant. Unless power goes out, then someone might have to go out there and hand crank it, which would not be the most pleasant thing ever. Is that all controlled over at uh, the drop shaft in McCook? Uh, so that'll all be controlled at, that'll all be controlled at either mainstream, which is right outside of the water, water reclamation plant over in Stickney. So we have a big room with a bunch of computers and remote, con like uh, we have remote or uh, cell phone towers at a lot of our facility, like a, a lot of our remote facilities that'll just send signals back and forth. So we can control all the gates and, and, and we measure levels in the, in the reservoir and measure levels in the, the tunnel and then we can control things, so. Have you found any gators down there? In the tunnel? Yeah. Uh, I, I personally have not. Um, I have any, like I actually, I'm in charge of our videotaping contract and I have not seen any gators in the sewers yet, so we're not in Florida, so. Uh, we have mules in the 1928 picture. Yeah, I think that they were, they, the mule was hauling the, the rock out of the sewer. I, I don't think any, any person would want to be hauling rock for uh, 
7,500 feet of a very large diameter sewer out of that tunnel, tunnel system. Anything else? Well, thank you all for having me tonight. My name's Orion Gailey. I work with Christopher Burke Engineering. We are the village engineer here in Riverside. Um, tonight, I'm going to give just a brief um, presentation about the First Division sewer separation project, which is ongoing right now, and a little bit of background about the sewer system as a whole. <clears throat> uh, background on the village, as many of you probably know, it was incorporated in 1875. And like many older metropolitan communities, the village of Riverside is predominantly served by a single combined sewer. I'd like to thank uh, Fred for providing all the information about combined sewers, so I don't have to do that. Um, but as you now know, you are served by a combined sewer. Um, it's very old sewer infrastructure out here. The first sewer atlas is from 1936, and much of the old sewer infrastructure still remains in place today. Um, today's sewer system, um, again, is primarily combined sewer system. There are intermittent storm sewers, uh, mainly along the west side of town where it's adjacent to the Des Plaines River. Um, we also have some relief sewers in town, um, which include the Des Plaines River, the MWRD interceptor, as well as the TARP system. Are the relief sewers considered storm or sanitary? The relief sewers? Yes, are they? They're combined. They are combined. Mm -hmm. um, some problems that um, arise with having a combined sewer system, when the sewer system is surcharged, um, and the interceptor and tarp cannot handle that um, water, the sewage then does dump directly into the Des Plaines River. Um, and that is a combined sewer overflow. Um, all combined sewer flow is also treated, as, as Fred had mentioned, by the MWRD wastewater treatment plant in Stickney. And you do have millions of gallons of clear water that's being treated and doesn't necessarily need to be. <clears throat> More locally with the first division, um, we have a confluence of sewers which bottleneck just north of Swan Pond, right over here, um, where you have a bunch of moderately di sized diameter sewers that go into a single sewer that goes into the interceptor, and that sewer is not large enough necessarily to take on all the sewers that are converging to it. <coughs> also today, all clear water discharge, including people's downspouts, sump pumps, yard drains that are connected to the existing combined sewer system are also contributory to sewer backups um, during heavy rain events. Uh, with the new storm sewer system that we're implementing in the first division, many residents will now have an opportunity to bring that water out of the combined sewer system and put it into the storm system. Uh, just a quick picture kind of showing how the system works. You have the local combined sewer, which takes yard drains, downspouts, your sewer waste in your home, as well as your street drains. And those all go to the local sewer, which then dumps into the MWRD interceptor. When it cannot take the flow during a storm event, it will go into the tarp. And when the tarp gates are shut and it cannot take the water, it then goes into the river. Um, so how did we get to this project today? Back in 2014, the village had our firm, Christopher Burke Engineering, put together a comprehensive um, analysis model of the sewer system as it relates to the stormwater. Um, in order to do that, we integrated the existing atlases and GIS information um, into a program that we used to hydraulically model it. Um, and our intent was to develop some projects that would improve the performance of the sewer system as well as reduce and or eliminate the combined sewer overflows going into the river. Um, again, some of the data sources that we used as part of that study included the village's GIS sewer atlases, um, some historical storm sewer atlases, or what we believed at the time to be storm sewer atlases, um, MWRD interceptor and tarp plans, um, some minimal, minimal field survey at the time, and the Cook County aerial topography. Um, with that, we were able to determine that there's 
seven watersheds that predominantly serve the village of Riverside. And a watershed is basically a, an area of land that all um, drains into a certain spot. So you basically have seven different watersheds um, that drain the village into the MWRD interceptor. Um, so some of the proposed improvement projects that we had come up with at that time were the low hanging fruit projects. Some projects that were low cost, relatively easily constructible, um, that would reduce sanitary backup in people's homes, as well as um, identify areas where we could separate those sewers um, to limit the amount of combined sewer overflows into the river. And we were also consistent with the village's green initiative of reducing the amount of uh, wastewater being, or clear water being treated at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and this was to serve as a backbone for a long term capital improvement plan. So as you can see, we developed a project for each one of those watersheds. Um, you can see here, we have the railroad watershed proposed outlet. Um, this project we're actually working with MWRD on right now, and they will be um, funding most of, if not all of this project, and it's around $90,000. Um, and that will take um, basically a, a good portion of the land that is west of First Avenue um, that is mainly storm sewers, but then converges into a combined sewer. We'll be taking that flow out of the combined sewer and bring it directly into the river. Um, that'll free up some capacity downstream. And then secondarily, we have the, at the time we called the Scottswood Sewer Separation Plan, improvement number two, which is now the first division sewer separation project, as you can see here. So at the time of the study, we had established this as the storm sewer routing necessary to um, fully separate the sewers. At the time, we thought um, this area along Scottswood here was all storm sewer. Um, so the areas that are in yellow is what we thought were going to be the proposed storm sewer routes. Well, when we began actually designing it, we did come up with some obstacles. Uh, we discovered through our survey and some field reconnaissance that what we believe to have been just storm sewers did indeed actually have some sanitary as well, so they were technically considered combined sewers. Um, some of the reasons for us not knowing this up front were the village's GIS um, atlases contained some obsolete information. Again, it was designed based on these 1936 um, atlases, and unfortunately, there was not always sufficient as built as different projects happened throughout the years. Um, we also identified a number of private sanitary connections um, into what were believed to be those storm lines. And at the time of design, we did verify those through smoke and dye testing. <coughs> Which brings us to our final design that we have now. In order to separate all of the first division, we did need to enlarge the scope of the project to pick up those other areas. Um, oftentimes, we took what was that combined sewer, which was originally thought to be a storm, and we're now making that the dedicated sanitary sewer. We did have some houses already connected to that anyway, so we're taking the homes off the real antiquated, which ranges from like nine inches to um, greater than that, but nine inches is very small, obviously. Um, so we're taking and abandoning those sanitary sewers and bringing the, those homes to the combined sewer and putting in a new dedicated storm sewer. Um, so we have Approximately 10,000 linear feet of new storm sewer that will be getting installed. Um, and with that, about 2,000 feet of new sanitary sewer as well. Um, we have 137 new sewer structures, which would range from your inlets to your catch basins and your manholes. Um, we have five new or upsized outfalls at the Des Plaines River, which is where we'll be conveying all of that storm water um, to the river rather than to the MWRD interceptor. And as a result of the project, we will be replacing approximately 5,000 square feet of sidewalk and about 6,000 um, feet of new curb and gutter. Um, this year, as part of the project, in order to get all of the storm sewer in place this year, we are temporarily patching the roads. And next year, there will be a, another project to resurface all of those roads. Um, as far as the schedule goes, right now we are in stage one. Um, we'll actually be finishing stage one, the sewer installation portion maybe tomorrow, sometime this week for sure, at which time we'll then be going over to Fairbank, working on an outfall here, another outfall over here, and then working our way up Fairbank and Blooming Bank. 
And then obviously we'll proceed accordingly to stage three, four, uh, five, and then six are a couple uh, miscellaneous outfalls. Our completion date is in October and right now we are on, on pace to hit that completion date. Um, some benefits that everyone will see as uh, this project comes to a conclusion is we will be eliminating the combined sewer overflows into the Des Plaines River within the first division. Um, this will provide environmental benefits to the Des Plaines River habitat. Obviously, not bringing in sanitary waste is a, is a great thing for the uh, habitat there. Um, we'll also be affording additional sewer capacity both to the upstream and downstream sewers within the village. Um, by doing that, you'll <clears throat> have less frequent occurrences of surcharging and sewer backups and combined sewer overflows into the river. We'll also be decreasing the volume of clear water that is currently being treated by MWRD. So going green by reducing the amount of energy consumption as well as um, the cost associated with that um, work. Next steps, um, as you can see we had five other projects in the different watersheds um, that we had identified. The goal would be to get to, with village staff when this project is complete and try to figure out a way to budget in some more of those projects. Um, and once we did that, this is a map that we did during the study. So um, we are showing some of these areas as being separated where they're not necessarily. But this is more or less a good representation of what the village has now. Blue being areas where you have storm sewers, red being areas where it's all combined. Um, if all of the projects were implemented, it would then look like this when those were completed. Ideally, if possible, it would be great to separate the whole thing. Um, if not, at least the tarp will be online here shortly with larger capacity to handle these other areas where separating out the sewers is a little more difficult. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Again, thank you for having me. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, I walk along Fairbanks Road quite a bit. Mm -hmm. All right. And they have erosion fencing set up going from Fairbanks Road to the river. Yes. Are those all going to be outfalls? Um, there are five outfalls. Uh, I can show I'm you. I'm basically talking uh, from the Burlington Bridge going downstream toward. Uh, yes. So you'll see one that's. You'll see. There's the staging area, right? Just yeah. further north of that. You'll see that there's a big backhoe sitting there. Yes, just north of the bridge. Yeah, okay, That's an outfall location, yes. Right. But there's upstream from there on Fairbanks Road, there's about two or three more. So you have one here, which is the one we were just talking about. Right. There's another one here. And another one here. Uh, what about going the other direction? This way? Yeah. No. No outfalls over here. No outfalls. Nope. There are many old outfalls on the river. There are, yes. I mean, some of them things are in horrible condition. They're caving in, they're falling in. Is there ever going to be any uh, program to possibly get rid of them? Or I think most of them are no longer operating at all. Have you seen water coming out of any of these? Rarely. Right. What you see out of them is infiltration, not actual water. Right, right, right. right. So I think they're all already abandoned. We did look into that during the design. Um, there's not really any plans to do anything with them because they're not really harming anything unnecessarily. Um, so I'm not aware of any plans to do anything with those at this time. You, you pointed to two of them. Where are the other three? You got one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, more questions. About you would be able to increase the outflow when the project was done on, on the sewer system. How does that affect the other projects uh, as far as money that might not have to be spent? Sure. So um, it'll be kind of a trial by fire, right? So if we have some events and everyone's noticing that you're not having the sewer backups that you had, then maybe we can scale back some of those plans. Um, the way we modeled it, though, we're still only um, modeled for like a 10-year storm event. So I, th I do think it's still worthwhile to move forward with some of these projects. Um, but that is, that is point. That combined with um, when the TARP goes fully online, too, 
you won't have as many issues. And then it's more just reducing the amount of clear water that you're treating and things of that nature. And then additionally, the homes that are not connected is part of the project that they will not have to pay privately for the connection and this will be part of the public project to get connected? So private connections, we did send out a letter to the people in the first division that were eligible to get a connection and in order to be eligible basically you just had to live adjacent to where the new storm sewers are going. We have had some people outside of those areas that have contacted us and we are going to the contractor to get quotes to basically bring a storm sewer further to wherever they're at and it's that homeowner's responsibility to pay for it if they so choose to have it. Is there a link to the village's website to get project updates? Yes, we update every week. Okay. Um, I can't tell you exactly where it's at, but it is definitely updated on the website weekly. Because of the backup problem, a lot of people are put in back quote preventers because yes. Are those people, as these projects continue, going to find that a lot of that is unnecessary or relevant because of the separation of storm systems? So much less frequently, um, but you still do have a fair amount of people that have their downspouts, sump pumps, etc., tied into the combined sewer. So if you do have a very large um, event, it's still possible that you could be getting some backup if you don't have a flood prevention, but it will greatly reduce the occurrence of those things happening. So have you calculated how critical it is for people to do the disconnect to have the full benefit of this project versus what, they, what would happen if they don't do it? Unfortunately, we don't know who's connected and who's not entirely or what's connected, so it's, we'd really be guessing if we tried to figure that out. I mean, maybe I missed it, but in the uh, diagram, where does the, uh, behind the, the library here is like an access point and then up the river is another some type of access point. How does that fit in with the sewer system or doesn't it? Or, um, here? Uh, I don't know. I mean, just off um, by the, the sledding hill here is some type of access thing. Are we talking over here? No, I'm talking outside the building. No, behind the library, I'm talking about. That's a district overflow so, that's over here? designed to call the district. You can see yeah. I think that's right. I think that's connected to the deep tunnel. Okay, yeah. So just there's a spot over here and then up the river. I would guess those are deep tunnel access yeah, points? Those are, those are uh, connecting structures. Okay. So are they used ever? Or is it yeah, so when, when there's a storm event and then it requires relief to our intersecting sewers, then it'll be used. Then it'll go into the tunnel. Oh, okay, so yeah, those are locations where the interceptor goes into the tarp. Okay. So in my rudimentary sketch here, when, when this doesn't know, those are access points for the interceptor to go into the tarp. Yes? So clearly in first division, there's been a lot of um, 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 streets dug up, a lot of gravel, a lot of dust. So you said that, that they will be paving the sidewalks. What, what, what will be paved this year and what will be put off next so, year? And what should we expect the conditions to look like in that period in between? Right, so this year any sidewalk or curb that is damaged will be replaced this year. And Before how that- How about driveway aprons? Driveway aprons as well. Okay. The only thing that's not going to be addressed in full this year are your trench patches. So the trench patches we will be putting down two inches of asphalt to get you through the winter. Um, and then we'll be resurfacing and doing full depth patching on those trenches at that point. So there point. won't be exposed gravel? There won't be any exposed gravel. Your sidewalks will all be in place. Your curb and gutter will be in place. Your landscape, grass, et cetera, will be restored. Wonderful, thanks. Yep. Have you done any analysis of whether or not any of the new tunnel system would need to be lined now to extend the life further? The new tunnel system, meaning the local sewer? Yes. Um, so the local sanitary sewer, we are in the middle of televising that right now um, to identify areas that are in need of lining. And I anticipate, yes, there will be some areas that need to be lined. I think the worst of it, because um, we did do some fair amount of sewer televising before the project started as well, 
I think the worst of it we already are abandoning, um, but I do envision seeing some more areas that will need to be lined. Is there ever a need to uh, line a brand new piping system? No, I couldn't think of why we would need to do that. Is your pipe all plastic? Are you going to put in all plastic storm sewer pipes or? Yes. Okay. I think the largest diameter is either 24 or 30 inches and it's all. But it's all PVC or whatever? Yes. Whatever they use, okay. So that has a lot less problems with the joints as far as roots and all kinds of stuff getting in it? Yeah, I mean, nowadays your, your reinforced concrete pipes have gaskets on them too to okay. help with that issue, but yeah, I mean, PVC is it's a I mean, good Because the product. old tile pipe, when you had four foot sections, every joint was a Yeah, and problem. I mean, those were just, you know, kind of yeah. push joints that weren't really very They well weren't secured. very tight. Right. Yeah. But yeah, even concrete pipes now have, have rubber gaskets in them too that you can install. Okay. I'm a little confused by that last question here. I live on Scottswood, mm -hmm. and where they're putting in the new storm sewer, and yep. it is cement pipe. Yeah, so I don't, I don't understand. Maybe oh, you're, you're right, you're right, different. yeah. The, our larger diameter storm sewer is, is concrete. We it's do all have concrete, some concrete. Yep. right? And I think they might be using some of that for the connections to it, you know? Uh, I don't know. From the catch basins to the to the manholes, yes. Oh, no. yeah. You're right, I'm sorry. All right. The, the smaller diameter is PVC. The sanitary sewer is all PVC, but some of the larger diameter is concrete. Right. Okay. How do you choose between concrete versus PVC? Um, or is that a contractor option? It, it can be a contractor option. So we specify type of pipe. And when you specify type of pipe, a lot of times based on the height differential between the top of the ground and your top of pipe, there's multiple options that you can choose. Is that because of the temperature and falling and, and heating of the um, More structural stability of, of the pipes. Anyone else? Well, thank you all for coming.